Hello, good morning. Welcome everybody to what is the final webinar of the Finance and Darbo Network of the Year. Um, I'm Georgina Geddes, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of CFO South Africa. Uh, we will just wait for a few more people to fill up the room um, so we can do what we always do while we're waiting for things to get started and talk about the weather. Um, it seemed like we were going to have a full-on day of terrible rain in Johannesburg, but it's now cleared up into a beautiful sunny day. Um, You've joined us here in the room for um, smart regulation by the CIPC through XBRL. Uh, it's, it's super technical stuff, but I think it's, it's hugely beneficial for, uh, for finance professionals. Um, thank you very much for joining us and welcome. Um, I'm just gonna wait a little bit longer for a few more people to fill up the room. In the meantime, please, will you introduce yourselves in the chat, making sure that you're addressing all attendees and panelists so that everybody can see who's joining us, not just the panelists today. Um, it's great to have you all here. Um, thanks, for, thanks for coming in and joining us. I can see that the room is filling up nicely. Um, so without too much further ado, I am going to um, go into the go into the webinar itself. Um, thanks everybody who's been joining us so far. I can see um, Fortunate, Sharad, Joanna. It's really great to have you here. Thanks so much. Great to see your participation in the chat. Please let us know who you are and where you're from. Um, okay, let's let let's jump in. As I, as I mentioned already, I'm Georgina Geddes. I'm the editor in chief of CFO South Africa. Um, today we're bringing you one of those, I think, super technical but super useful webinars. Um, and we've got great experts in the room who will help unpack it, um, and I think demystify it a little bit. So we've got. Uh, so basically what we're looking at is during 2018, the CIPC embarked on a journey of digitalization um, when XBRL was implemented for financial reporting, but why? What were the reasons for this radical transformation of financial reporting in South Africa? And is the CIPC's initiative showing tangible benefits after more than three years? So in this webinar, um, these representatives from the CIPC, CIPC will unpack how the XBRL program is unfolding and what XBRL is achieving for regulation for financial reporting in South Africa. We'll hear feedback on the recent upgrade of the CIPC's taxonomy, the CIPC's future plans, plans to incorporate cooperatives into, into using XBRL for financial reporting will also be addressed. You're going to hear from Henny Yun, an XBRL specialist at the CIPC, Chuma Zwane, an investigator at the CIPC, and Aubrey Morifi, a team manager in administration in the cooperative units also at the CIPC. Um, so welcome to all of you and thank you, thank you for joining us and making the time to, to share this great information with us today. Um, and without any further ado, let's jump into Henny's presentation on digitization and how and why this has been done via XBRL. Aubrey and I will go off camera and Henny will share screen. Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much, Georgina, for the, for the introduction and opportunity to, to present about our exciting XBRL program. I assume everybody can see my presentation. Just want to make sure we, of that. We can see it loud and clear. Okay, great. Just want to move this bar here in my way. Okay, I'm going to talk about smart regulation by the CIPC through XPRL. Now, for those who may not know, XPRL is an acronym that stands for Extensible Business Reporting Language. I'm not going into the details of that because at previous um, webinars we touched on the technicalities about XPRL, but if everybody anybody has questions about XPRL, um, the technology, they're welcome to ask us during the course or later uh, when I session of this um, presentation. So um, let me just, just a high level summary of the content of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about why XPRL, why the CIPC went to the root of this technology standard, and also the steps of progress. Um, we, we didn't just implement XPRL for the sake of implementing a new technology, but there's very good reasons for that. I'm going to touch on digitization through XPRL as a foundational strategy um, on how we receive data in a, st a structured format through digitization. I'm going to touch on the process optimization for the reviewing of the annual financial statements and also regulatory transformation through business intelligence that uh, was enabled by the introduction of XPRL. And then lastly, I'm going to provide some feedback on the latest implementation of our um, latest uh, taxonomy. My other two colleagues, Tumar Zwani is going to touch on um, actual statistics and figures and trends and graphs that we see from XPRL, from our business intelligence component. 
and Aubrey is going to touch on the cooperatives implementation of that on the XPL next year. So if you look at this next slide, um, the three purple blocks are basically the steps. Uh, digitization was only the first step. And that by that we mean that we are moving from unstructured data to structured data. So we convert financial information into, com into computer readable format. Now, previously we only received financial statements in PDF, but the PDF document doesn't constitute data in a database or a data warehouse. So there's not much you can do with that. It's a manual process of, of uh, reading through that set of statements. Um, the digitization itself is something that's also ongoing. On an annual basis, we update our taxonomy. And by taxonomy, I just mean a data structure. Um, but the reasons for digitization is actually step two and step three. Um, it, it's not about digitization for the sake of getting uh, financial statements in electronic format for the sake of that alone, but we're actually built on that. Um, process optimization is to improve operational efficiency inside the organization and how we can op automate uh, internal processes. And then the regulatory transformation is uh, we use expert L for strategic benefit or effectiveness of the CIPC's purpose as a regulator. So the next slide is moving from unstructured data to structured data. I'm going to read two quotes. The first quote is from the current strategic document of the CIPC, which reads that digitization remains key to the CIPC in preparation for the fourth industrial revolution. Now, what do we mean by the fourth industrial revolution? And there I want to read a quote on the website of the Presidential Commission of, um, of, on the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which says the definition of this industrial revolution is not quite set in stone and the technologies as associated with it are moving targets whose true value will reveal themselves to, to us as we explore them. However, the, the Fourth Industrial Revolution can be broadly defined as an integration of faster efficient and intelligent technologies. And that is exactly what we achieved by, by XPRL. So the digitization of data through XPRL, we see that only as the foundation, um, like I've mentioned in the previous slide, to, to uh, achieve process optimization and regulatory transformation. The next slide shows you two processes. The previous process of how we received annual financial statements before 1 July 2018 was just a matter of um, entities who were required to submit annual financial statements, produce those statements in a PDF, and they emailed those PDFs to the CIPC. But you can imagine when we receive that PDF from a mailbox, it's a very manual and very, uh, very laborious and time consuming process for investigators to analyze that. Um, even simple calculations like checking that totals are actually correct had, had to be done manually with a calculator. And it was very uh, uh, totally unstructured and there's nothing that managed that process of analysis. Um, so when we introduced XPRL, all of that changed. The second process uh, on the slide um, shows you that uh, we can... We, Customer entities have different source documents. They can still use PDF documents or they can produce their financial statements in Word or in Excel. Some large companies have uh, back-end data in uh, sophisticated back-end systems and they can just click a button and produce financial statements from these various sources. But then what happens with that is we've got a conversion process with any of those source data or source documents or back-end data needed to be converted into the XPRL format as required by the CIPC. Now, a converted XPRL file is just a .xhtml file, which means it is computer readable and human readable. Um, it, you can open it in a, in a web browser and you can see the financial statements. It looks like a PDF, but it's actually then um, in XHTML format. And for that, you will see the ending of that is software service providers. That means there are external companies 
which we call software service providers. There's a panel of software service providers that the CIPC approved of. When we initiated this program, we invited IT companies who, who's got the ability to convert any of these source documents or backend data into XPRL format to become part of our panel. And we evaluated them all and they provide a wide range of services. Uh, we try to cater for very small companies who do not want to spend a lot of money and also for very large corporates who's got sophisticated back-end systems. Currently, we have 22 software service providers registered with the CIPC on our recommended software service provider panel. And the list of them can be found on our website. So what they do is they take these source documents or backend data, they convert it in XPL, um, and, that, and that conversion is based on a taxonomy or data dictionary. Now, previously, on our previous process, entities just email to PDF, and there was no standardization. For instance, some companies reported on revenue, calling it revenue. Some other companies called the same data concept uh, income or sales. There was no standardization. But when you bring in a, a data dictionary or taxonomy, you define um, data elements, you, you, what it should be labeled, you define exactly what it constitutes of, you define ratios, uh, um, um, relationships between various data elements. And that is based on uh, accounting standards. Now the CIPC has implemented two accounting standards. First is IFRS, the International Financial Reporting Standard that's updated annually by the International Accounting Standard Board. And secondly, we recently implemented GRAP as well, the generally recognized accounting practice. Now, these two different accounting standards apply to different sets of um, entities, you know, target groups of entities. Uh, GRAP, for instance, is uh, uh, applicable to state-owned companies and municipal-owned companies. Um, then once that source data has been converted, it went through this process and based on that taxonomy, uh, client entities need to upload or file the, the financial statements to the CIPC. And for that purpose, we've developed a portal. We call it our e-services portal. And uh, a client entity need to register as a, a user. They open the portal. They basically type in an enterprise number to identify the correct entity. They upload the set of financials, and then at the point of upload, we've got automated validation built, built into the system. Now that entails about 80 different tests that the system uh, checks. For, for instance, mandatory data elements, there are certain data elements that must be part of every set of financials. Um, it does calculations, for instance, those totals that I mentioned that our investigators had to do manually previously. The system can now check that uh, totals are correct. Um, it also calculates other formulas, for instance, the public interest score. There's a number of validations and the system checks for the accuracy of that filing, even before anybody at the CIPC lays eyes on that set of financials. So a lot of the um, tedious work that the investigators used to do manually previously is now automated by a system. And when that file, that was uploaded um, didn't pass all these validations. The system will indicate that um, the filing is rejected and it will display the, the errors that was picked up. And then the entity who tried to submit the set of financials need to go back, fix the filing, and they can upload it again. So by the time the CIPC actually accepts a filing, a lot of validation has already been done. We know that there's a lot of accuracy and completeness already built into that. And then we store that into the CIPC data warehouse. Um, I forgot to mention, uh, uploading the CIPC, the CIPC portal also, um, it's also incorporated into the annual return process. Now the annual return process as defined by the Companies Act um, constitutes of a number of steps and there's fees that needs to be paid. Uh, and then part of the annual return process, every entity is supposed to submit either a set of annual financial statements or financial accountability supplements. Now, financial accountability supplements is just a simple form that, that, that needs to be completed on a system, while the annual financial statements are fully blown financials in XPL format. 
And uh, there's rules which determine when AFS applies and when FAS applies. I'm not going into that into detail now, but what I want to mention is the hard stop functionality. So we've automated also into that this process that if a set of financials is required and it's not submitted as part of the annual return process, the process will stop. So the system will now make sure that annual returns are not submitted without a, a proper set of annual financial statements when that is required. So this process explained here, um, explains the automate, automation, the standardization, um, the validation. In other words, that we receive structured data in a quality format, but then what do we do with that? This is only the foundation. This is what constitutes digitization. But then we built on that. And my next slide shows you the, the automated process for the review of annual financial statements. Uh, the gray uh, process, is, it's, I'm not going to look into that in detail. It's just to demonstrate to you that there is a full-blown process of review um, that's automated in a workflow system, which is something we didn't have previously. Um, I want to look at uh, the notes on the right hand side. System makes provision for selecting sample files for analysis. Uh, we do not have uh, the capacity to look uh, at each and every file, um, you know, for in depth analysis by a human investigator. So we do, do sampling for analysis. Um, then the process is fully automated, like I've mentioned got different roles built into the system of segregation of duties. So for instance, a person allocating uh, a set of financials cannot allocate it, that set of statements to him or herself and then do the analysis themselves and then approve that statement themselves. So it must go to um, another person. And there's also levels of authority or access rights inside the system. Is for instance, uh, departmental aid and department, divisional aid, who only uh, people, uh, users with that le uh, level of authority or access rights in a system can approve a set of financials. The process includes uh, proper customer engagement. So query letters, for instance, can be sent as part of the process if it's necessary to uh, query something in a set of statements. And our system also keeps a complete order trail of all the actions taken by the system and by all users of the system. And on a monthly basis, we record that, we print it, uh, we generate a report and that gets signed off for auditing purposes. So digitization through Expert L enabled us for our process automation, for internal efficiency, the way we work, how we actually do the analysis. Next uh, slide looks at regulatory um, transformation. So the purpose of the CIPC is not only to collect data, uh, but actually to do analysis on that data um, for regulatory purposes. So this, what you see here is a screen print of our business intelligence reporting component of our solution. Uh, you see there are folders. Now each folder represents a grouping of financial statements. For instance, there's analysis financial statement submissions, there's auditing analysis and compliance, and then the next one with the red square around it is financial analysis. The arrow indicates the individual reports under that grouping of, of reports, which is for instance, enterprise historic analysis, enterprise key ratio uh, ranges, the top 500 revenue of assets. So you can see we've, we can do something that with the data that we receive through XPRL. And uh, the purpose of this business intelligence is for compliance monitoring, for early warning uh, purposes and to take corrective action when we see something goes wrong with a certain entity or even trend analysis across um, different entity, entities in a whole uh, industry, for instance. We can, for instance, compare, uh, say, the mining industry with the manufacturing industry. And since we built up a repository over time, we're in the fourth year now where we receive financial statements so we can see what happens with a certain entity over a period of time, but we can also compare industries with other industries over a certain period of time. That enables us even to assist government with policy formulation um, to manage the economy in a proper way. All of this wasn't possible before the introduction of XPRL. 
I just want to move to the next slide. I'm clicking here and it's not working. Okay, there it goes. Um, both slides I mentioned now is just uh, to explain what we are doing with XPRL, but I've mentioned the digitization itself, where we receive the data in structured format is an ongoing process on an annual basis, we update our taxonomy to stay abreast of the latest developments uh, with regards to the accounting standards. So this year on the 1st of October, we uh, successfully incorporated the IFRS 2021 updates as released by the International Accounting Standard Board earlier in the year. Um, one change I wanna mention is the change to the public interest score calculation. Uh, public interest score is calculated based on different criteria. One of the criteria, for instance, is on turnover. Uh, the Companies Act says that for every million rand or a portion of a million rand, one point is added to the public interest score calculation. Um, so, but one million rand and, and one rand will then mean, used to mean two points. So we've changed the calculation now to mathematical rounding. Um, meaning that everything up to 1 million rand, 499,099 rand um, will only constitute one point and above that it will become two points. So it's a little bit of a change in how we interpret the calculation of a public interest score. And uh, we've also downgraded the severity of the validation on this. If the public interest score of a client entity, which I submit the, the IFS, uh, is not correct, it used to be an error and it blocked the, the filing. Now we've downgraded it uh, to, a, to a warning. Um, and then I've mentioned GRAB. GRAB filings are now mandatory. Previously, only IFRS was implemented from 1 July 2021 until um, on the 1st of October this year, GRAB filings now be, also became mandatory. Like I've mentioned for state owned entities and for municipal um, owned entities. Basically it's all those entities who are man managed by the Public Finance Management Act or by the Municipal Finance Management Act that we've added now under the umbrella of XPRL. They were not uh, previously part of a XPRL. And then I've mentioned that the validations care of a lot of um, tedious work the investigators used to do, uh, but we still find that even though the, the system can check to a very large extent that we receive uh, proper financials, that the, the, the sometimes the quality of what I um, report on still lacks. Uh, for instance, where we need an explanation or why a certain monetary data element cannot be reported on, the system in a taxonomy makes provision for proper reasons. Sometimes people don't type proper reasons for that. So we've introduced the data quality management framework now, uh, applicable to the software service providers who are responsible for providing solutions to the entities out there who must submit financial statements. Um, that was also introduced on the 1st of October, and on a quarterly basis, we provide those uh, software service providers now a feedback on the quality of the individual statements. So we're checking for completeness, correctness, accuracy, and consistency as the main criteria. But we've broken down those four criteria into 13 different um, metrics. So we try to really improve the quality of the financial statements that we receive now. And that, in short, is what my uh, presentation entails. I touch on the higher level concepts. Um, my colleagues will now talk more about the actual ratios and figures that we see. Tomorrow will touch on that. And then uh, uh, Aubrey will talk about Im implementation of cooperatives as well. So thank you very much from my side. Uh, thanks, Henny. That was great, and I, I, I really liked your the, the, the 4IR definition you were working with that said faster, efficient, and intelligent technologies. And it sounds like you really have been applying those at the at the CIPC. Um, I've got a few more questions around that, but we'll get to those at the end. Um, Aubrey, I'd like to invite you on camera. This is Aubrey Morifi, who will be talking about the CIPC's plans to implement XBRL for cooperatives in 2022. Uh, so, Henny, can you stop your share? Um, hang on, there we go. 
Aubrey, please, will you come on camera? I'm going to invite you on camera. Um, ask to start video. There we go. Hi, Aubrey. And then you're, you're also on mute. Let me see if I can do something about that. Okay. Hello. No, there we go. Okay, welcome. I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, it actually says host has disabled participant from screen sharing. That's terrible. Let me make sure that you are allowed to again. It should work now. Looks like it's coming. There we go. You still need to, I think, go over into presentation mode. Yeah, I'm beginning. There we go. Perfect. Looks great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Obrim Rifi. As I've actually been introduced, I'm actually team manager within the cooperative division. Um, I'm also with my colleague, uh, Mabuse Muyeti, who's also team manager within the cooperative division. Uh, Basically, with this presentation, I'll just sharing with everyone uh, our intention uh, with the coming year to actually incorporate uh, uh, cooperatives, uh, financial reporting on XPRL. Uh, on this slide, basically, it's just uh, just the table of uh, what the presentation will be about. Uh, the Cooperative Act uh, was actually amended. Uh, 2005 amended act amended was actually amended uh, with the 2013 Cooperative Act. So on this uh, presentation, we would actually uh, stating uh, the different categories of uh, cooperatives, uh, financial reporting framework, uh, documents that are to be submitted, as well as the annual return fees, as well as the implementation date. With the amended uh, Cooperative Act, it actually makes provision for uh, the following uh, categories of cooperatives with uh, you've got your category A cooperative which have a financial annual annual uh, revenue uh, of uh, less than 1 million and then you've got your category A2 uh, which is have your annual revenue of 1 million or more but less than 10 million and then you have got your category B um, of 10 million or more, but less than 25 million. And then you have got your category C, which are your bigger uh, cooperatives, as well as your secondary, tertiary, and national apex fall within category C. On this slide, uh, uh, the following year, we actually intend to incorporate, as I've also stated, to incorporate a submission uh, of annual fees as well as annual submission of financial statements via the XPRL system. On this slide, it actually gives a uh, uh, the different annual fees that will be applicable. As you can see with the first one uh, for your smaller cooperative, as I've indicated on the previous slide, like your category B with uh, less than uh, 1 million turnover, the annual fee, the annual fee will be, uh, if lodged within 30 days of the due date, will be uh, 50 rands. But then once it, it is lodged after the, that due period, then there will be an extra uh, penalty of 50 rand, then the fee will be 100 rands. And then with your category A primary cooperative of 1 million, but less than 10 million, 
similarly, the annual fees uh, will be, if lodged within uh, 30 days of the due date, will be 50 rands. And similarly as well, if lodged after 30 days of the due date, will be 100 rands. Then you've got your category B, a primary cooperative uh, of 10 million, but less than 25 million. Yeah, and then if lodged within 30 days of the due dates, uh, that will be 450 rands. And then if it's late uh, 30 days after the due date, then it will be 600 rands. Then you have got your bigger types of cooperatives, uh, 25 or more, 25 million or more. Uh, if lodged within 30 days of the due date, uh, it will be 3,000 rands. And then if lost after the 30 days, it will be 4,000 rands. And then we also have your annual fees uh, for your category C, as well as your tertiary and national apex cooperatives. In this case, uh, as it's actually reflected on the screen, with this type of uh, cooperative, if lost within 30 days of the due days, it's 450, and lost after 30 days, it's 600 rands. The Cooperative Act also makes provision for uh, record keeping. Uh, record must be kept by the cooperative, and record that can be kept by the cooperative also refers to things such as your uh, accounting records, uh, your constitution and rules and amendments thereof, uh, minutes of general meetings, um, list of members, your registered directors, uh, accounting records and financial statements must be kept for a period of five years or longer, uh, longer periods uh, determined by the minister. And the COP Act also states that, you know, for example, if the COP is unable to comply with this requirement, uh, uh, that could be uh, seen as a, a criminal offense. Uh, similarly, we also require uh, certain documentation uh, that a COP can also be able to submit, uh, like your for smaller cooperative, the A1 primary cooperative, they can uh, submit the, the COP7 and COP8, uh, as well as the COP15, which is about your income statement and balance sheets and annual report. This information can be uh, submitted uh, by the directors. Similarly, with the primary A2, uh, category, uh, they can also submit uh, same uh, because they are smaller entities. They can also submit um, the COP15 annual report. And this information can also be submitted by the directors of the co-op. Then as we move along with your category B, they can submit your COP4, COP7, independent reviewed financial statements, uh, this can be submitted by an independent reviewer. Similarly, with your primary COPC, uh, they can submit financial, uh, audited financial statements. Uh, this financial statements are to be submitted by the auditor. Uh, most importantly with CIPC, we actually um, embracing um, te 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 technological advancements, uh, but I'm not sure what's happening with my screen now. Uh, You've gone out of the presentation itself. So yeah, I think click on from, from beginning again. Maybe 
just have to get back to the slide you're at. There we yes. go. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, the COP uh, makes uh, 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 clear definitions, what, you know, what annual report are, what an independent review reports are, and what an audited uh, reports are. Uh, in terms of an annual report, a report uh, which is submitted by the board containing uh, like your financial uh, statements, social reports, uh, as well as the management uh, decision report. Uh, with the independent uh, reviews report, uh, it's actually reviewer reviewed, examined and evaluated financial statements, social report, an independent means uh, accounting officer in terms of close cooperation act, uh, a registered auditor or a member in good standing in terms of section 33 of the auditing act, profession act. With the project milestone, uh, to incorporate cooperatives as we've actually stated. We anticipate uh, to launch a pilot, pilot project uh, by the 1st of April uh, next year, which will then uh, be able to give us uh, you know, opportunity uh, you know, to monitor how the system actually works and, and, and how cooperatives are also you know, receiving uh, the system itself. And, uh, by the 1st of October, we then um, anticipate uh, to implement um, uh, mandatory, mandatory uh, compliance at, 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 at that time. Uh, during the period, uh, we'll also be issuing notices as well to cooperatives uh, through our websites and other social media platforms and we'll also be uh, publishing uh, in the government gazette, uh, notifying uh, cooperative uh, of intention to, uh, to mandate them to file um, uh, on annual return as well as uh, financial statements on XPRL. Cooperatives, uh, that are required to uh, submit uh, audited uh, are your category C, primary, as well as your secondary tertiary and national apex, where they will also have to submit their financial statements via XBRL. And XBRL usage will be available for independent uh, reviewed annual financial statements. However, uh, it shall not be uh, mandatory. Uh, similarly, uh, if there are any other queries, uh, cooperatives can be able to go on the CIPC website under the QRS, which is the query resolution system, and be able to, uh, to make further inquiries relating to this aspect. And on a regular basis, you can also check uh, for notices uh, that will be notifying uh, cooperatives of uh, you know, future developments, as we've actually stated, as well as uh, social media platforms such as your Facebook. CPC is very active uh, on those platforms as well. And notices will also be published on those platforms. Thank you, thank you very much. That's great, Aubrey. Thank you so much for sharing that information with us. Um, I was very interested to hear that you're very active on your social media platforms. And I'd like to ask um, Henny um, if you could post that in the chat for everyone, um, your, your social media links. I think that that would be hugely, uh, hugely useful for our audience. Um, our third presentation now is Chuma. Um, I'd like to invite you on camera to talk about actual stats. And I loved, um, I loved your, your, your uh, presentation title, which was Compliance and then within in brackets non compliance trends. So um, please, yeah, uh, please pop on camera and let us know more about that, Juma. Welcome.
Thanks, thanks, Georgina. Um, I see Tendo's hand is up. I don't know if uh, that's got to do with something urgent before I proceed. I have seen it as well. I've, I, I'm just asking people if they have something to ask, please pop it in the in the chat, um, and we'll and we will get to their questions. Okay, Tendo's from CIPC. Uh, is the building? Oh, it's burning? one of it's one of yours. Yes. I think it might be just an accidental hand raise. Okay, <laughs> all right, <laughs> no problems. Um, can anyone, everyone see my screen as yet? It's there. Awesome, wonderful. So, okay, I'll sprint through this um, from the last person in the relay. Um, so yeah, as introduced, my name is Chuma Zwane, uh, an investigator within the Corporate Compliance and Disclosure Regulation Unit. Uh, investigators are basically the people the commissioner sends out to companies who misbehave as it were. <laughs> so if you get an email from one of them, just know you're, uh, you're in trouble. Okay, so yeah, just maybe briefly in five minutes or so. Um, okay, my slides aren't moving for some odd reason. All right. Um, we, as, as, any, as, really as any, as any, um, summed it up basically i guess he built the scaffolding and the ground engineering of what i'm talking about that he touched on um so on the left of your screen would be what the system um picks up when 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 a financial statement is filed um financial statements as any introduced it or alluded to are filed in xhtml format which is then the xbrl file which we consume in in, in IXBRL, inline XBRL, human readable. And then the system extracts all the information that is not human readable, uh, machine to machine, and packs that in the data warehouse. So we're able to generate uh, automated business, business intelligent reports from, from the left side of the filings. And then thereafter, we do uh, sampling on a quarterly basis. Um, yeah, ranging between, uh, I think, around about 200 companies per quarter due to limited capacity. And there we, the output of, of that work is what we call the AFSRC findings, uh, the Annual Financial Statements Review Committee findings. This committee sits uh, quarterly to present what they um, discovered in the financial statements they reviewed. So the scope of the reviews is informed by two things. Um, the Companies Act by default, and then because the Companies Act prescribes if there is an interest for SMEs, um, as well as whatever the PFMA prescribes for, 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 for certain SOCs and, and government entities um, registered under the Act, we then uh, do the analysis based on that, uh, on that framework. So at a core, or at a minimum, the financial statements, as you should know, uh, should include at a minimum, an, an auditor's report, statement of cash flows, statement of changes in equity, statement of financial position, and statement of profit or loss, and other comprehensive income. So based on the outgoing financial year, or in fact, yeah, on, on the left side of your screen, this is the outgoing financial year, the CIPC 2020-2021 financial year end. And then on the right is the three-year comparison of what we have um, generated uh, in terms of findings from the financial statements reviewed since the inception of the of, of, of XBRL. Uh, what I will just highlight here is that uh, of the sampled companies, we had about 212, to be precise, that uh, were companies which were contacted to explain why they were not compliant with the requirements or the financial reporting requirements of, uh, of the Act and EFRS. And then of those, one resulted in a compliance notice being issued. If I remember correctly, it was because the, the financials were materially defective, meaning they did not meet the minimum reporting disclosures as required by IAS1, which is what I touched on in my first slide. Um, so uh, what to avoid here, um, or rather let me just say to avoid being um, investigated those who are responsible for filing financials to CIPC must ensure that what I alluded to in my previous slide, which is uh, this one, is in the XHTML file that is being uploaded. Even though the, the system will automatically tell you what's missing and what doesn't tell you or, 
what's been omitted, uh, enough diligence is required to ensure that this set a minimum um, is part of the file you are uploading. So that um, users of financial statements, since CIPC is not the only um, user of Fs, there are other government entities, other regulators, uh, unions, employees as well, investors, etc. They also use your financials. So in the case where um, the copy of Fs ends up in another company's hands, they should be able to uh, make informed decisions in totality regarding the financial position, performance, and cash flows of the company. On the right, okay, I think Georgina, you will share the slides to the audience so that I don't you know, spend too much time talking about the stats that they can analyze in their own time. But anyway, so the, the one on the right is just what we've discovered over a three year period and the output of which is summarized in here. I mentioned earlier on that um, a few companies had their F sub materially defective, meaning we rejected them all together. They didn't meet minimum um, disclosures. Um, and then the highest problem that we've had over the years or since inception was that of missing reports. In other words, the set of financials submitted were missing, didn't have either a director's report or a, um, what's this, an auditor's report. It may have been missing a social and ethics committee report depending on whether they are required to do that or not, um, et cetera. So this is the summary of uh, the findings informed by what's required by, or in terms of IFRS and the Companies Act. Um, there was, we've, we've done proper change management over the years regarding this, but the mistake here was that companies were, were mistaking minimum tags for, for minimum disclosures. So what do we mean by that? We've prescribed about, I think, just under 60 minimum tags or 62 minimum tags, um, which are, we call mandatory tagging requirements. So that does not constitute a full set of financial statements. It merely means that a company or filers must tag at a minimum those particular line items of values so that the, the file is validated successfully in the in the portal and thereafter the disclosures come into play do the financial statements meet uh, the accounting uh, framework used by the company whether that be if it's, if it's SMEs and now of late uh, grab for socs and other state organs of the state incorporated under the the act um so fantastic so the we also realized or discovered that uh companies the, the there were a set of companies in total, about 3,006, if I remember correctly, who, I don't know, just 6,000 and something actually, uh, who had filed um, financial statements and disclosed one value as their revenue. And then when filing annual returns, they had a different value altogether. And the variance of the two figures was over 100,000. So, other reports, there, there, were, there were those who reported over, oh, where the difference was more than a thousand, but I just focused on those who had 100K plus. Those were about 6,000 or, or so. Um, this, is, this can constitute a material um, defect in the context of disclosures in that the company is reporting to the, on the one hand that their turnover is so much and then paying, paying annual return fees based on that. And then the financial statements, there's a different figure altogether. Uh, there should be a direct congruence, if I may call it that, uh, of, of these two figures to avoid um, further penalties or, or being issued with a compliance notice or having to refile financials. So sometimes the figure in revenue is less, sometimes it's more. Just make sure that the, the two tie up or, or match. We also then discovered that um, this is now in particularly in the outgoing financial year, that um, 436 public companies, to be precise, were supposed to file financial statements in IX period because they're public companies. And because they're public companies, they are mandated to have the financials or required to have the financials audited. And then that triggers, qualifies them for submitting to their F and XPRL. That caused a problem. Uh, we've published a notice last month requiring companies to remedy this, after which if they fail to do so, 
we will uh, issue them with a compliance notice, uh, which might have other legal implications. So be on the lookout if you are a COSEC, company secretary of a public company, ensure that you do the right thing um, and not uh, cut corners merely to meet a deadline and submit a report on your side. That's that with this. So to summarize what I've been saying in the past seven minutes, um, the XHTML file submitted in XPRO or for the purpose of XPRO should reflect the published PDF financial statements, which are generally published either in a company's website or provided to um, other users of Fs, whether it be SARS, uh, your shareholders and other stakeholders. And the financial statements should be complete, accurate and reliable. They should be comparable and understandable. This is basically the conceptual framework of EFAS. And lastly, they should be a faithful presentation of the companies or filing companies, financial position, cash flows, and financial performance. That's that to sum up my portion. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask uh, further questions at XPRL or rather XPRL at CIPC.co.za or through our inquiries um, functionality on our website. Thank you, Georgina. That's me. Over to you. Thank you, Chuma. Great presentation. Great uh, streak at the end um, <laughs> to, to, to catch up time. We've been actually receiving some questions. Um, so thank you very much. They've popped up a little bit in the Q&A. Um, so let's, let's, let's stop your share and bring everybody else on screen so that anyone can chip in uh, when they want to respond to a question. So Henny and Aubrey, please turn your cameras on. I'll do a request just to make it even easier. There's Henny. And let's see, Aubrey. No, everybody's everybody's joining us. So great, thank you guys for this uh, informative um, informative presentation today. We've had a couple of questions from Jay Sykes. Um, his first was: Is there a plan to normalize and align retention periods in respect of the Companies Act and the Tax Act? So I don't know who wants to take that one. I can see everyone's having a big think. Well, <laughs> well maybe you can uh, reply to that one the best. <laughs> Yeah, so far, I, I don't know whether the, what rather the income tax says, but so far the companies are still prescribed the seven year period, retention period. Uh, I believe that's still the same because we have not yet amended the Companies Act. So when you say, do we plan to align the two? It might mean the tax act, income tax act says something else and the Companies Act says something else. Could, could he perhaps uh, provide clarity on what the income tax prescribes? Because so far it's seven years in terms of the Companies Act. Okay, so uh, Jay Sykes, please feel free to uh, to give us a little bit more clarity on that, and then we can we can delve into it a little bit deeper either in the chat or the Q and A as you have been. Um, and then the second question he posed was, will or he or she will we see the same good governance rules applied to trusts as a subset of the work done for businesses? I missed more it. thinking. <laughs> do you want me to do you want me to repeat, Chuma? Yes, please. Okay, um, will we see the same good governance rules applied to trusts as a subset of the work done for businesses? Oh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's tricky. The, the Companies Act has no jurisdiction over trusts. That's the problem. So we have, yeah, the Companies Act or rather the Commission has no jurisdiction over, over trusts. That's uh, done through the masters. Until such time that perhaps we have some form of collaboration to regulate trust as well. We have no jurisdiction. So they, yeah, they are a separate um, bunch of entities all together. Governance on their side uh, is not, is not uh, regulated by us. Okay. Well, that does sound like you have a good set of governance rules. So it would be <laughs> for whoever whoever's in charge on that side would be would 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 do well to look to you. Um, so Jay uh, Jay Sykes has said thanks. A retention of five years were noted in the presentations. Oh no, it's actually it's supposed to be seven years. Did did you say five years in your presentation, Henny, or was it Aubrey? No, I was didn't mean retention uh, period. Yeah, the Co-ops Act is is different, so it's not. The Companies Act says one thing, the Co-ops Act says, says another. So I think for Co-ops, it's five years, whereas for companies, it's seven. I think that's where he missed us, uh, or what Jason missed us. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. okay, great. And then I think this one will be for you, Aubrey. It's from Sianda who says, what are the provisions for submission in the case of cooperatives that are exempt from audit? Um, if you, uh, if Sienda look at the 
my presentation, we've actually made uh, a distinction between uh, uh, different types of um, uh, categories of cooperatives, also taking into account like your smaller, smaller uh, types of uh, cooperatives. Uh, with those type of cooperatives, they are still also required by the Cooperative Act also to be able to file uh, annual returns on the CIPC um, uh, system. And also in terms of, of submission, uh, they can also be able to submit um, um, like your uh, independent um, reviewers report to indicate um, um, the types of transactions that they've actually had. Uh, maybe Mabusi can also add in uh, to add if maybe I might have omitted any other thing. Mabusi, you can come in. No, I think we, oh. I think, yeah. Hello, can you hear me? We can. You even yeah. can come on camera if you like. Oh, <laughs> we've, okay. got a, we've got a ghost fifth panelist. <laughs> okay, no, thank you. Um, with regards to cooperatives, because they are uh, divided uh, according to different categories, then basically there's no exemption from submission of annual reports or even annual returns. So everybody must submit depending on their categories and their revenues. Thank you. Thanks, Mabuse. Okay, so I mean, I think that that is, uh, that's what we have uh, from the audience so far. I had one, I was gonna ask for one roundup question, which is just, um, what do you feel would be a key takeaway um, for everybody who's watched this presentation here today. So what, what, what information would each of you hope that they would, that they would stick with? So we'll start with you, Henny. Um, what is, the, what is the, the, the key nugget of information that you hope that our audience will, will have? Yes, I think I would like to mention that uh, sometimes we get the impression from the various industries that we regulate that the CIPC is just adding some uh, technology burden on them for the sake of adding technology, uh, you know, implementing technology, but that's, no, that's not the case. What we tried to demonstrate today was um, through digitization, the, the CIPC is able to improve our internal processes and to regulate their effectiveness. Now, why do we want to do that? We want to prevent um, things like, for instance, what happened with um, Steinoff, you know, a lot of money was lost, but through investors. We want to protect every individual working the streets of South Africa, because even though you may not, you may not be part of a large company that we regulate, uh, most people contribute at least to a, a pension fund, for instance, and that pension fund money is invested in companies. And the CIPC regulate those companies to make sure that they are financially sound. So everybody in the country is eventually protected through this regulation. Uh, or the reg regulatory function of the CIPC. And we do it in an optimal way through introducing expert L technology. So I, I wanted to let that sink into the audience and uh, the minds of the audience. Um, we try to make it as simple as possible. It is not necessarily a massive burden on the entities who need to uh, comply because the, our software service provider panel who uh, assist entities with the conversion to expert L make provision for very cheap solutions of less than a thousand rands up to very expensive solutions for very large corporates who's got complicated and sophisticated systems in place. So it doesn't need to be a nightmare. If you're an entity, you need to comply to the CIPC. But the benefits of that eventually um, is really um, huge with regards to the economy of South Africa. That's what I want to say. Thanks. I think that was, a, that was a fantastic summary. I mean, I don't think it gets more, more clear or important than that. Um, Shuma or Audrey, Aubrey, do you have anything to add to that? Or, 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 or is, that a, is, that a, is that a good hard stop? 
<laughs> no, thank you very much, Georgina. Um, I think uh, for cooperatives, uh, the takeaway uh, would be, uh, most importantly, as we've also indicated during the presentation, that uh, we're also looking forward to, you know, um, putting in um, or incorporating cooperatives on uh, XBRL. Uh, the nice thing um, about it is that, you know, in XBRL has been uh, with CIPC for, 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 for a while now uh, with uh, the companies and close corporations. So uh, as cooperative, we'll also be piggy banking with um, uh, what the companies have been doing. So I think it, it's also a good uh, opportunities for a cooperative as well to be able to, to, to come on board. And uh, uh, yeah, so as CIPC, as we, you know, embracing with the technological uh, advancement and changes, and we also would like to, you know, you know, the ease of doing business for the, uh, our members of cooperative and our, our stakeholders, and, and and so forth. So yeah, so it's 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 quite uh, very good opportunities, very good prospects for for our cooperatives. So yeah, so we we actually looking for uh, to be able to 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 work with them um, 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 in this field of uh, XBRL and and an annual submission. Thank you. Fantastic, Obi. Thanks so much. And Chuma, over to you. Yeah, just in brief, thanks, Regina. Uh, now, I just want to encourage the participants to whatever role they're playing, basically, in, in their companies to, to see compliance, not as a burden, because that's generally the culture of the issue towards it. Um, it's not necessarily a burden, but it's more of a value add in the long run, um, in the context of, you know, like with JSE, somewhere along the line, if you want to list, they would want to check the history of uh, compliance with the Act over a certain period before you, that, that forms part of the vetting process. So yeah, just as a take home, see compliance as a value add and not as a as a cumbersome or burdensome task. That way, more diligence will be applied in ensuring that um, they tick all the boxes and that it's a, it's not just a, 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 a textbook approach rather, but more of a value add for the company's broader governance um, role in the broader economy. Yeah, that's that. Thanks, Regina. Jim, I like your final point. See it as a value add, not as a, a grudge. <laughs> um, I'll be interested to see if you can if you can convince people, but I definitely think that the, the outcomes, you can't argue with the outcomes. So I think that that's a, a very solid argument. Um, Aubrey, Henny, Chuma, it's been great to spend this last hour with you. Um, audience, thanks for your um, participation, for your interest. Thank you for spending time with us. This is the last Finance and Dubber Network uh, webinar of 2021. Um, so can you believe it? We'll, we'll hopefully be seeing all of you again in 2022. Um, so have a fantastic year end, uh, Christmas if you celebrate. Um, and we will see you back in the new year. Thanks once again to the CIPC for this webinar. Cheers, everybody. Awesome. Thanks for hosting us, Regina. Thank you. Thank you, Georgina. Thanks Thank you everyone. very much. Bye. And cheers to everyone. Keep well.